Thank you, everybody. Um, this is my second time in Berlin, and I've been to New York, California, but Berlin has a very different vibe, so really great people here. Um, I noticed nobody's sitting in the front seat. Um, I don't really bite. <laughs> okay, so this talk is meant, um, so how many people here know what RAG is? Retrieval Augmented Generation? Okay, so this is the perfect talk, because I'm going to talk about advanced RAG techniques. Um, a little bit about myself before we begin. Uh, I work for Weaviate, it's an open source vector database. Uh, probably more importantly, I'm really passionate about AI. I've been working in AI for about 10 years now, so before ChatGPT. Um, and I don't think it's gonna kill us all. So, RAG is a very general purpose tool. What I'd like to do is start off by grounding us in an example. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the example of an average human doctor and trying to build a chatbot using RAG to emulate or assist a, a, a human doctor uh, as, our, as our analogy or as our example to ground ourselves, right? So if you think a little bit about the average human doctor, uh, in North America at least, they study for seven plus years after undergrad. Undergrad is four years, so seven plus years after that. Uh, and they see about 100,000 patients in their entire working life. So the next time you go see a doctor, you present them your problems, and effectively what they're doing is retrieving from their knowledge base that they've built up over 11, 12 years of studies in medical school, but then also their experience of, of seeing 100,000 patients, and they're trying to see which patient uh, is, is most relevant and their experience is most relevant to help uh, diagnose you. So the reason why this is relevant is if we wanted to take a human doctor and we wanted to encapsulate what they do and how they do it into a chatbot using retrieval augmented generation, it's going to need a lot of moving pieces. So this is a very complicated thing to emulate. And this is why we need more advanced rack techniques, right? The very first thing we need is a knowledge base. So this knowledge base that the doctor has built up off 10 plus years of study, 100,000 patients, we're going to need some form of replacement for that. We're going to need to search over this knowledge base because a doctor is not really uh, using all of their knowledge. They're only using a very specific uh, piece of knowledge that's relevant for your case. Right? If you go to them with a foot problem, they're not going to, they're not going to uh, reason over irrelevant pieces of information. Right? We also need the reasoning piece. They need to be able to retrieve from this knowledge base that's in their mind and then reason over which, what applies, what doesn't apply in your case. There definitely needs to be explainability. And depending on what field you come from, this might be important, this might not be important. But in regulated fields, explainability is important. So giving the right answer is not enough. Giving the right answer for the right reason is what's required. If they tell you that you need to take so-and-so pills or you need to go for an exam, they have to also tell you why. Right? This is super important. And if we're building an AI-powered tool, it definitely needs this. Because this is how we assess whether it's doing the right thing, whether it's understanding. And then to, to wrap it all up, it has to be in real time. So the patient comes in, they present their issues, and this thing has to retrieve, uh, search, it has to reason and explain uh, and suggest a, a diagnosis or a, uh, or a next step for that patient. So one additional thing, everything that I talk about in this talk is open source, and I'll have uh, sources at the bottom, so you'll get the slides afterwards, you'll be able to implement everything that I talk about as well. Uh, the majority of what I'm going to be using are open source libraries, um, some uh, academic papers, uh, just to introduce some uh, concepts. Right? Uh, but the whole talk, beginning to end, is open source, and you can implement it yourself as well. All right. So if we take this problem of trying to build a chatbot that can act as a human doctor, or at least assist a human doctor, the simplest solution is literally to take patient information. So the patient comes to you, and they tell you that they have so-and-so problem, you take that information, you give it to a language model, and then the language model gives you some form of cheat sheet, or they tell you uh, this is the drug that you should be prescribing, or these are the next uh, tests that you should be running for this patient. This is literally the simplest thing that you can do. It's the equivalent of going to ChatGPT and typing the patient's information in. And so there's a couple of things that we can do to improve this. If we fine tune the language model on medical data, it'll do a little better. This is the equivalent of taking a, a family doctor and training them to be a cardiologist. Now they can deal with heart problems better because now they're tuned or they've studied 
uh, uh, they've studied more specialist data. Right? So you would take medical literature and you can tune and train the language model uh, to understand medical literature better. And I'll get back to how this actually happens. And the second thing, which is probably even more important than the first one, is how you talk to the language model. Right? So getting this information and providing it to the language model and the strategy that you do it with, if you show it examples or not, if you, um, if you retrieve external information and you augment it into the patient's information, all of this is pretty critical. Uh, critical enough that there's a whole branch of uh, academia that's trying to study prompt engineering, but specifically for medicine as well, there's a whole paper where they show you how prompting correctly in the field of medicine gets you, uh, gets you much better performance. Okay, so this is the simplest solution. I'm not gonna dwell too much on this. I'm gonna move on to the RAG solution. So this is what I call the RAG doctor solution. I'm gonna start off with the simplest solution. So a simple genera uh, generation loop here. And then we're gonna add in uh, a couple more things here. Right? So the first thing we're gonna add in is that knowledge base that I talked about. And so this knowledge base is typically patient information. So this can be lots of uh, historical patients. So if I take everybody here and I take your medical history, I can index that and that could be something that I could retrieve from, right? Or if I take, let's say PubMed or Nature or Science and I take all the different abstracts from it, that could be another source of information that I could put into my, uh, into my uh, information or my knowledge base. I'm gonna take that and I can put it into any database. Here I mentioned a vector database, but this can be any sort of database and I'll talk about that uh, later as well. So now you've got this unique patient's information and you've got a knowledge base that's filled with millions or billions of patient-specific uh, patient uh, information. Right? This could have to do with different diagnoses, different drugs, when to take them, when to stop them, so on and so forth. Right? So now what you're gonna do is take that patient information and you're going to query the database with whatever is relevant from this knowledge base. So this knowledge base is pretty expansive, could be billions of objects, you only care about maybe the five or 10 things that are relevant to this particular patient. Right? This would be the equivalent of going to the doctor and the doctor ignoring 99% of the information that they know over their, uh, over their entire lifetime and picking out the 1% of information that is relevant to you. So the database outputs these five to 10 responses and then you take that and you pass it to the language model. And the idea here is that you're retrieving information relevant to this patient, and then you're augmenting that information along with this patient's information to the language model. And now the language model has sources that it can cite, it can read reference material before it generates. And this is the simple retrieval augmented generation. Uh, the bottom part here is the retrieval stack, and the upper part here is the generation stack, right? So you augment the generation using retrieval from some knowledge base. And so what I'm going to be doing in this talk is essentially taking this stack and telling you how you can improve each one of these components. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is indexing. You can have billions of documents. How do you ingest them? How do you cut them up? If you have images, if you have charts, what do you do with those? The second part is the retrieval component, which a lot of people here are familiar with. How do you ex exactly extract out the documents that are relevant and ignore the ones that are irrelevant? and then the generation part, right? So I've got about two to three different techniques um, that, that are, some of them are pretty cutting edge, some of them are uh, standard, and I'll talk about how, uh, how you can implement it to uh, improve this workflow. Okay, so that's the basic RAG setup, right? So in action, this is what it looks like. and it goes in that order. So you retrieve and then you generate. And in order to retrieve, you should, you should have already indexed all of your data into the database. And this could really be a stream of information. So you could be uh, adding data into the, into the database as it comes in. Okay. So, so in this particular case, because I want to uh, ground this in the example that I gave, the data set that I'm going to be using and I use to build this project was, it's called the PMC patients data set, and that link will take you to the exact data set just to get an idea of what it looks like. Um, but to summarize it for you, it's about 170,000 patient summaries. So you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you next steps, you follow up on those next steps, you go back to the doctor. So it's a account of one patient's interaction with the doctor, 
and the, the outcome of that, right? And it's also got about 1.4 million medical abstracts, just to give general knowledge about the field. If there's new discoveries, uh, if there's invalidated discoveries, uh, that's also available there. The cool thing about this data set is that everything is vectorized and you get the embeddings along with the data, so you don't have to do uh, the embeddings yourself. And in, in particular, in this data set, we only have text, but in general, you can also have image, images, charts, videos, and audio uh, that you can also put into your database. I'm not going to be talking too much about the images, charts, and videos in this talk, because this talk is specifically centered around improving uh, text-based RAG. Um, and then the cherry on top with this data set is that it's a, retri uh, it's a, a retrieval data set, so you have benchmarks and ground truth labels of if you have one patient come, come in, which five patients are the ground truth most closest to this patient? So you can actually assess your retrieval pipeline to see how well it's performing. And so here you've got the two examples where if a patient comes in, you can pull relevant articles. So these are medical literature articles, but you can also pull in similar patients, right? This might be a, a similarly aged patient who had a, a similar problem and another patient. So you can pull from this, uh, this vast source of information. And another thing to note, this is more information than any doctor will have access to right now. And that's the whole point of, of building a, a RAG-based chatbot that has access to this information. OK, before I move on, um, it, some of you might be wondering about the using images and charts. So we actually have a meetup tonight where I'm going to be giving another talk on multimodal RAG. And the idea there is, how do you add in images, videos, audios to text and then give it to a language vision model to reason over. Uh, and so if people are interested, there's a, there's a link and, uh, and you can attend. Uh, I think it's pretty close by actually, 20, 30 minutes from here. Um, but I, I just wanted to add that in if people are interested in the multimodal component of it. Um, you can also look into that. All right. OK, so the first thing that I want to start off with is this idea of memory. I mentioned that we've got about 1.6 million documents that we've got on the side. We have to index them and put them into some database so that the language model, before it's asked to answer any questions or diagnose a patient, it can retrieve from that, right? Uh, and so this is, this is how I think of RAG internally. You need some information and you retrieve it and now you have access to it and you're an expert at it. So th this part of the talk can take kind of a, a bit of a fork. How many people know what a vector database is? OK, it's great. I don't need to, I, I had like four or five slides here that I would have unhid and talked about if, if uh, uh, the majority of the people didn't know what it was about. So I'm just going to uh, fall back on just one slide. So a vector database essentially allows you to perform scalable search. Um, for this project, I use Weaviate, which is open source vector database, um, and it scales up to billions of objects. So in this case, I took the uh, 1.4 million uh, medical articles and the uh, 170,000 patient cases, and I indexed them and I stored them in, uh, in Weaviate. Right? And the main idea behind a vector database is that it allows you to perform similarity-based search. So no two words might have been repeated in my case and another patient's case, but semantically they might be similar, and so uh, the vector database will still retrieve them. And so typically, let's say your query looks something like this. You go to the doctor and you tell them that you have uh, shoulder, uh, left shoulder pain and you have numbness in your thumb and index finger. They're going to put that query in. That's going to go to the database. The database can pull out patient IDs that are similar or patients that have had similar problems to you, but then also articles about patients or about remedies for, for your problem. And so in this case, we can talk about it if people have questions. What I've done is two vector searches on two different uh, indices that are stored in the same vector database. So this requires multi-vector support. Uh, if people have uh, questions about this, we can, we can go into it later on as well. OK, so we're going to use uh, WeV8 vector database as our tool to help uh, chatbots remember, and that's what we're going to retrieve from. So now we get into the, uh, the exciting part, right? How do we make this better? Now that we've laid the groundwork for understanding RAG, how can we improve on it? Right? And we're going to introduce about eight, nine different uh, RAG techniques. 
And the point of this talk is not to make everybody overnight experts in RAG, but rather give you practical resources and practical information where you can go back and you can say, I have the tools to, to start exploring and uh, improving my, my RAG pipeline. Right? This is one of the reasons why I've always got uh, resources at the bottom so that you have a jumping off point. If you want to implement one of these techniques, you know where to go next to do that. All right, so we're gonna start off at the bottom, better indexing. Before you even get to your RAG pipeline, you have to ingest, chunk, and index your data properly, and that sets you up for success. Okay, so we're gonna talk about chunking text. So the main idea behind chunking text is that you can have a massive amount of data, in this case, uh, 1.6 uh, 1 million documents, and each document could be multiple PDF uh, pages uh, worth of information. So the idea is that you want to chunk your data into semantically relevant and coherent pieces. So you could say, I want to do paragraph by paragraph, or I want to do sentence by sentence, or you can do some really interesting things. So that's what I want to talk about here. And this is not a trivial problem. There is really no answer of this is the best way to chunk. This is not a solved problem. Uh, because if your chunks are too large, then you might have uh, semantic information that conflicts, conflicts uh, other pieces or is about different things. You want chunks that are about one thing so that the vector it generates is uh, capturing that information. And if you chunk to, uh, on, a, on a smaller level, then you don't have any uh, semantic context. Right. So if I chunk word by word, then you have no idea of the context that word was used in. Right. Uh, and this is a really nice resource. Stack Overflow wrote a blog on chunking that uh, you can also check out. So the easiest way that you can chunk text, uh, and this is what I, I believe the majority of people uh, do use at this point, is you just take your documents, so in this case this uh, one sentence, and then, I think this might be easier. Yeah. So you take your, uh, your document, and you just say that I want to have chunk size of 35. So this is going to be a 35 uh, chunk size over here. I believe this is actually characters. And then you have some chunk overlap. The chunk overlap is actually pretty important because if you just cut off the chunk, uh, then you have no way to link what the previous chunk was talking about and connect that to the next chunk. So you allow for a little bit of overlap and then you decide how big of a chunk you want. Uh, the chunk size here depends on how detailed your writing is. If, you're, if your writing is very short, you have to judge your own data. You can uh, allow for smaller chunk size. Uh, the, more, the more details there are, the more descriptions there are, the bigger the chunk size you want, because you'll have longer uh, pieces of chunks that are semantically relevant. Okay, so this is the basic thing that you can do. The more exciting thing you can do is called semantic chunking. And the idea behind semantic chunking is very uh, interesting and intuitive, actually. Let's say you take your, all of your documents. So let's say you've got thousands of pages of documents. What we're going to do is take sentence by sentence. So this is my first sentence. I'm going to chunk it. This is my first chunk right now. And then I'm going to take the second sentence, and I'm going to chunk it as well. And then you do that for every sentence. And then what you do is you calculate, you embed both these sentences, and you calculate the cosine distance between the two sentences. And the whole point here is that if, you, if two sentences are similar enough, they should probably be chunked together. If two sentences are different, then that's when you want to say, okay, this belongs in the previous chunk, and the next sentence gets its own chunk. And so if you do that over and over recursively over your data set, so, so this graph is a bit involved, but let, let's walk through it. What you're getting here on the x-axis is the sentence ID. So the first sentence has an ID of zero, the 50th sentence has an ID of uh, 50, so on and so forth. And what you're getting here is how similar the sentences are uh, to each other. Okay. So this is the cosine distance. If they're exactly the same, you'll have a cosine distance of one. Okay. And so the idea here is that you can have sentences that are combined uh, with the next sentence if they mean, uh, if they have, if they share similar meaning. And you would determine some sort of cosine distance threshold to choose whether to fuse a sentence and keep it in the previous chunk or to start a new chunk at this point. Okay. And so what this gives you is variable length chunks. So you can see chunk zero is bigger than chunk one, which is bigger than chunk two and chunk three. Uh, and this might be because the sentences are changing in meaning really quickly. And this is pretty robust. Uh, you can use a, a, a BERT-based model, uh, a, uh, a very efficient uh, machine learning model, to determine this cosine distance by vectorizing your data. Uh, and the resource here is at the bottom, so you can, you can have a look at this as well. 
Uh, this is also implemented both in Llama Index and Langchain as a library, so you can, uh, you can get this working out of the box. Okay. The next level of uh, chunking is called, uh, depending on who you ask, it's uh, agentic chunking, or I'll just call it uh, language model-based chunking. Uh, and the idea behind this chunking is pretty interesting. This is uh, my favorite type of chunking. Uh, it comes from this paper, but the idea here is that you take your documents, and this can be hundreds of pages of documents, you give it to a language model called a propositionizer. And this language model is very efficient. It, uh, it, for this, they use the 7 billion parameter model. And this model only has one job. Right? Its job is to read this sentence by sentence and decide and create uh, small propositions. Right? Propositions are one sentence and they're self-contained. All of the information that you need to explain the proposition is contained within itself. So every proposition here makes sense just by reading it. And then it d divides up the work uh, semantically. Um, and if you wanna if you wanna go into more details here, you can uh, actually have a look at the paper. But in order to train this model, they gave it this prompt that said your job is to take this text in and separate it sentence by sentence, such that three criteria are met. And then uh, one of those criteria is that the sentence has to be isolated and self-complete. It can't rely on other sentences. So you'll notice that each one of these sentences you can read and understand, and you don't need any other sentence to to do that. And so this allows you to go from a massive wall of text down to individual propositions, which you can read, which have uh, semantically, uh, uh, each has a semantic meaning. And then what they do is they choose how much to build up the, the chunks back, right? So you've essentially atomized the documents into these uh, sentences that make sense. And now you can choose which, which sentences to combine and the language model also combines these sentences. Right? So you give these propositions back to the language model and say, these are two propositions. Do you think they should belong in one chunk or should they be separated into two separate chunks? And you iterate over this. Uh, and this is probably the most extensive chunking strategy that I've came across. Uh, it performs the best, but it's very expensive because you're using a language model to do this multiple times. And then you can decide what, uh, what retrieval unit you want, right? Do you want propositions to be retrieved? Do you want compositions of propositions, which are sentences? Or do you want entire passages, which are, which are just compositions of, uh, of sentences over here? And they uh, also showed where proposition level uh, retrieval works better, where sentence level retrieval works better, and then where passage level retrieval works better. Uh, and they did it for general purpose data, so you would have to fine tune and kind of uh, pick the parameters correctly for your own data set, but they give you rules of thumb here. Right? Okay. And the second strategy to, to help with indexing is to use metadata. Uh, I feel this is really a superpower because when you're performing semantic search, you're kind of ignoring everything else about the data and you're saying, just give me something that means, uh, has a similar meaning. But what you should really be doing is when you index your data, you have the thing that you vectorized, the, the piece of text that you vectorized, but you should have a lot of other context. You should have the date, maybe. You should have, if you're passing in patient information, maybe the age of the patient. You should have uh, preconditions the patient has. And you can filter your search results using this, uh, using this metadata so that you don't even search over irrelevant information. So if you have a pediatric patient that comes into the clinic, you don't even want to retrieve information for patients that are over uh, over 18, right? Because the the, the diagnoses, the the route uh, for for different tests that that patient uh, can be uh, can be advised to go through is completely different from those other patients. So you can filter out the majority of your data uh, that's not relevant for your pediatric uh, patient. Right? And so the idea here is that you've got the query, and the query has information about. Uh, who it's coming from. So uh, this is particularly relevant uh, for the user Alice. And then you've got your data indexed here. You've got data for Alice, Bob, and John. You don't even need to see if the information for Bob and John is relevant because you know the query is only for Alice, right? So you filter out these two objects and you only perform search over the uh, information that's relevant for Alice. And you've significantly reduced the amount of noise uh, already that you can potentially retrieve from. Right? And so this is really easy to implement. All of the indexing and retrieval uh, techniques that I'll talk about 
Uh, I'll talk about how you can implement them with Weaviate. Um, you, can, you can use filters uh, to, to implement a lot of these. And there's docs down there to, to show you even more. Okay, so now uh, I'll talk about how do you improve retrieval. It's probably my favorite part of the talk because it gets into um, of the nuances of how we talk to vector databases and how we talk to language models, how we make sure what they're giving us uh, is relevant or not. Right? So the first and probably the biggest, uh, biggest uh, favor that you can do to your, uh, for your RAG pipeline is to use hybrid search instead of pure vector search. So the main idea here is that if you think about medicine as a field, and in general, wh whichever uh, field you come from, there's things that are semantically understood, but then there are also just key words that you need to memorize, right? So in medicine, you've got uh, names of, uh, of medication, you've got uh, body parts, anatomy, you've got different disease names, different diagnoses. Uh, all of these things are not semantically understood. You have to go to medical school just to memorize a bunch of this information. So it doesn't really make sense to semantically retrieve based on, based on these keywords. Right? If I asked you your flight was uh, tonight, you wouldn't, ask me to, uh, you wouldn't ask me to semantically uh, retrieve information. You would ask me for the keyword, which is the flight number, and then you would just search it up and find out information about it. Right? So the idea behind hybrid search is you want to keep the goodness of vector search because that's what gives you that human level similarity, but you also want to add in keyword search. If a patient is on a particular drug, or if a patient has uh, had a certain operation or procedure done, you also want to retrieve patients who have had similar uh, uh, procedures done or on similar uh, drugs as well. Right? And so the idea here is that both of these are good in their own realm. We'd like to take the best of both worlds. And this is where hybrid search comes in. Right? So in hybrid search, what you do is you take the query and you perform both keyword-based search as well as vector search. Uh, and typically, when we're talking about keyword-based search, we're doing uh, BM25. There are other algorithms, but uh, what we've implemented in Weaviate is BM25. And so you do both of these uh, in parallel, and then you, you need to find a way to uh, fuse the different rankings because you'll get uh, a list of results from vector search and then another list of results from keyword search. And then depending on how important you want the keyword results versus the vector search results uh, to be, you can weigh them and uh, re-rank them. And so to implement this, this is one, uh, typically that would be a vector or a near text search query. Uh, you can simply turn it into a hybrid search query, and then you can specify what, uh, uh, what query you want to uh, use to perform keyword and vector search. There's another parameter here that I haven't specified, which is alpha, which gives you the strength of uh, vector search versus keyword search. It adds up to one, and you can specify whether you want a 70-30 split of weights between vector search and keyword search. Uh, or, uh, so that's a hyperparameter that you have to play around with for your data set. And this, uh, when we work with our customers, we find is a really big improvement uh, to retrieval quality. Okay, uh, this is a very interesting technique. It's called query rewriting or query transformation. The idea here is to admit that we don't know how to talk to language models or vector databases appropriately. So the idea is that the patient comes to you with a bunch of information. You don't know what information to query the vector database with or what information to provide to the language model. You might think you know, but we don't really know. And this has been proven again and again where if you use a language model to write these queries for you, you can iteratively improve the results of both the retrieval as well as the generation. And so the idea here is simple. You give the information that, that the patient gave you to a language model, and the language model rewrites the query optimized for the vector database. And another language model will write the query optimized for the, for the LLM. And so there's two separate uh, libraries that do this. Uh, the, the library or the, the work that rewrites your query for the vector database uh, is, in the, is in the first resource there, and I'll show you how it works. And the, uh, and the library that rewrites your query that goes to the language model is the DSPY library from Stanford here. So I'll just quickly walk through how both of these happen. Okay, so the patient comes to you with this query, uh, like we talked about, left shoulder hurts, numbness, thumb, index, finger. You want it to be rewritten into this query. Pain left shoulder, numbness thumb, numbness index finger. Uh, 
This has less semantic meaning for humans, but it should have more semantic meaning for, uh, for the vector database. And so typically how this is performed is you take your previous rag setup that we had here, you kind of cross it out, and now you pay attention to this. Right? The patient tells you information about what's wrong with them. You go to a rewriter model. So this is a language model that's been trained to take in queries like this and rewrite them into a format that's more optimal for the vector database. So this rewrites your query, and now you take that query and you go to a retriever with it, and the, the documents here you get should be more relevant than the documents you got in this, uh, in this retriever stack here. And so you're essentially just admitting you don't, you're not going to send this query as is to a vector database. You want a rewritten format of that, and this model has been trained uh, to, to rewrite these queries. And this model you can access actually in this paper, uh, and it's also on Hugging Face, so the model itself is uh, open source. And for the second part, how do you rewrite queries for language models? This is slightly more complicated. The idea here is that depending on your task, depending on the input information and the output information, you will have to iteratively see what prompt is the best. So DSPY is a framework that allows you to uh, optimize the prompt and automatically engineer the prompt. So you give it in inputs and outputs, and you set it off on this optimization uh, process where it will try a very simple prompt, and then it'll see what the, uh, what the outcome was, and then it'll go back and ask a language model to rewrite the prompt. And it'll keep doing this, and typically, depending on which language models you're using, it'll cost anywhere from $5, 10 $15, depending on how big your uh, data set is. But after that, after that optimization process, you'll have a prompt that is guaranteed uh, to work well over a, over a specific data set. If your data changes or if you have drift, then you can just uh, reset up this process and, and go through it again. So these are two techniques that will help you prompt your vector database and your language model appropriately. Okay. And, the, and the last thing here is to tune, uh, fine tune embedding models. Uh, the main idea behind the embedding model is that you want to take your data and turn it into vectors. <clears throat> Typically, people start off with a really popular embedding model. Uh, a better way to go about this is to take your own data, turn it into inputs, outputs, uh, positive, negative pairs, and fine tune your own embedding models. And so for this project, what I did is I searched up on Hugging Face, there's millions of models there, and I found a model that was fine tuned specifically on medical data. And there's actually two models that I'm using. So this is called a bi-encoder uh, bi model, where the query from the patient will go through the query encoder. And this model has been uh, tuned to embed really small snippets of information well. And the information from my database, the patient information and the medical literature, will go through an article encoder. And this encoder is trained to capture the meaning of large, uh, large documents. So once you've implemented the other techniques, this might be worth considering. You have to have a sizable enough data set to fine tune these uh, embedding models as well. So this is probably not the easiest thing to do, but I've included it here uh, in case people are interested. And then I've also got resources on how to do this. Um, I gave an entire uh, hour long talk on how to pick uh, embedding models, which is linked there if people are interested as well. Okay, so the last part that I'll talk about is better generation. So the first part of better generation here is to make sure you remove as much of the irrelevant information that you've gotten from the database so the language model is not misled. If you're asking it to, uh, to uh, prescribe something to a patient who has a cold and you're giving it irrelevant information, that's uh, a really good recipe to get it to hallucinate. So you want to make sure that you cut out any irrelevant information. So the idea behind the auto cut um, concept is you can get back irrelevant information from the database, that's fine, as long as you can identify and automatically cut them off. And so here, we can use the ranks or the similarity, the actual vector distance, to identify which uh, objects are close and which objects are different from the close objects, right? And I'll show you an example of this just to uh, solidify things. So imagine you take your rewritten query that goes to the vector database, uh, and then you retrieve these, uh, these six objects. The other thing that you get from the vector database are scores of how similar these objects are. Right? So you can think of these as the, the inverted distance or the opposite of distance. So the first thing is very close. 
one thing that you'll notice is that the scores, the scores will drop uh, really heavily after the fourth patient. Okay? And so the idea here is that these first four patients are, uh, are semantically similar to each other, but these uh, are end to the query, but the last two patients are not. Right? And the only reason we get the last two is maybe because we asked for uh, six patients, and you can automatically cut out these patients because here, uh, in the database itself, you can say, I automatically want to limit it to one segment. And when I say one here, it means uh, one segment of uh, scores that are in the same uh, vicinity. And so to actually do this, we look at the derivative of the similarity score, and we look at if it uh, rapidly changes, and we determine that as one segment. If you had changed that one to a two, you would actually get both of these. So this is something that's uh, really simple to implement. You can just turn it on in the vector database with your vector search. Reranking is another very powerful tool. The idea behind reranking is that even though we've done all of this to, uh, to kind of index our data, we chunk our data, we still want to have another model come in and reassess how well uh, our retrieved objects uh, match up to the query. So what we're going to do is retrieve similar cases, but this time we're going to retrieve a lot more than we need. And then we're going to use a much heavier model. This is typically a, a model that has a very high latency, so you can't afford to get it to attend to every single, uh, every single object you have in your database. And then you get it to re-rank the objects. So how this works is you take your query in, you get out a lot more objects, so you overfetch, and you've got the vector database similarity that, uh, that is given to you. We're going to ignore that for a second, and we're going to go in and use a re-ranker model to say, is this patient really the most similar to the patient described in this query? And the re-ranker model takes in this patient and this patient information and uh, assesses it together, and it realizes, oh, maybe it's not the most similar, so it demotes it to the third, third uh, spot here. It takes a third patient and says, okay, this is quite similar, and it promotes it here. And so here, because you're only uh, doing it over a, a, a smaller number of objects and smaller number of patients, uh, you can afford to re-rank. And then you can, uh, you can use these uh, re-ranked scores as opposed to uh, these. And the idea here is that these are a lot more relevant than these ever were. And so this is also a single uh, uh, line to implement. There's different re-ranker uh, models, open source and closed source, that we've integrated with, and you can, uh, you can take advantage of that by just by adding this to your query as well. And the last technique here is uh, fine-tuning the actual LLM. So for this project, I actually used a, a, um, a model called Meditron 70 billion, which is a fine-tune of Llama 2 70 billion. And so the idea here is that if, you've, if you specialize the model in the domain that, you're, that you want it to perform well, uh, it'll actually uh, perform better. So it'll underperform on tasks outside that domain, but it'll overperform within that domain. And so uh, this is shown in the open source model as well as in the paper where they took the 70 billion parameter model, they unsupervised fine-tuned it on 50 billion tokens of medical data. This is just the PubMed uh, literature. And then they also supervised fine-tuned it on more medical uh, multiple choice questions as well. And then when they assessed it, it outperformed its base model, which is the Llama 270 billion, but it also outperformed a much larger model, the GPT 3.5 model. It's not exa exactly comparable because Llama 2 in general saw a lot more data than GPT 3.5, so even though this is bigger, it doesn't mean that it's, it's uh, better. Right? And so this is the kind of the training regime that Meditron 70 billion went through. You take the Llama, Llama 270 billion model, you can continue the pre-training on the 48 billion tokens, but then you've also got the supervised fine-tuning on multiple choice data. Okay. And so this is the overall uh, RAG uh, improvement. So uh, just walking through one by one to, to give you a, a summary of it. How do you improve indexing? You chunk better. So I've introduced three different chunking techniques uh, and using metadata to filter and not search over irrelevant things. Uh, this will definitely improve the results you get. For retrieval, you uh, instead of doing pure vector search, you want to use hybrid search because now you have the flexibility to go from vector or keyword. And depending on your alpha, you can go completely to vector or completely to keyword. Uh, query rewriting is a very 
small investment, but a very uh, large return. Uh, and then fine tuning, I would say, is a larger investment and you have to decide whether it's worth it or not. The more specific and niche your use case, the more you'll get out of fine tuning the embedding model. And then the generation part, auto cut and re-ranking are very low investment, high return uh, techniques that you can employ. Fine tuning the LLM is a, is a slightly more uh, arduous process. You have to set up your data set. You have to decide how you're going to fine tune it. Uh, look into frameworks to do that for you as well. Right. Awesome. Uh, a lot of this can be uh, very detailed. So what we've done, uh, uh, what uh, I don't know if Eddie's here, um, he might be at the booth, but what we've done is we've built a app that essentially takes a lot of these different techniques and we've built a chatbot around it and we've actually got sprints to add a lot of the techniques that I'm talking about here uh, into this chatbot and we've open sourced the whole thing. Right? So on the left you can pass in, you can ask questions, so this is the chatbot piece and for now this is indexing our own documents and our blogs but because it's fully open source you can put in your own data and you can use this as a POC for your own uh, RAG application. Uh, and so this is open source on GitHub. Uh, we're also demoing this uh, at the booth, so if you want to come by later. Uh, there are no booth numbers, but the booth has balloons, so you can, you can identify it uh, anywhere in the conference. All right. So this is probably a really good practical jumping off point. If you want to look at any one of the techniques, we've got all of them in our pipeline to implement and put into Verba. So if you want a practical version of everything that I've talked about, this repository would be uh, great uh, to look at. And these are also some of the reference papers that I've uh, used for this talk. And there's uh, some really good blogs down there that talk about uh, this as well. So when you get the slides, you can have a look at this. Thank you so much, folks. If you enjoyed the, uh, if you enjoyed the content here, we think a lot about uh, RAG workflows and RAG pipelines and kind of taking what, what's in academia and bring it uh, to industry and implementing that in the database. So give us a follow, uh, check out our Slack channel. And if you have any questions for me, you feel free to connect with me. I'll, I'll take some now, but um, I'm always happy to have one-on-one uh, -on -one coffee chats as well. Thank you, folks. Mm -hmm.